You know, there's no, no airplane on earth like a Dakota. I remember my first impression was, man, this is luxury. It, it was made as a commercial aircraft, and that meant that the pilot and the co-pilot sat in leather padded seats, and everything was right there at your fingertips. There was room to move around. It was a wonderful aircraft. Well, of course, I put uh, over a thousand hours, I think, altogether. And so and naturally, I am in love with the old aircraft. You know, it was slow, uh, but it was very, 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 very reliable. This is the uh, C-47 Dakota. And of course, uh, our aircraft, 436, we have it painted on Canucks Unlimited. And it's remarkable the people after the war, you know, the military, British military, that still remember us dropping supplies to them when they needed them so badly. Now our aircraft, I've heard of Dakotas in Europe that had some sort of a rolling ladder to bring your, your heavy load in or, or uh, uh, slip-proof floors. Well, ours had just nothing but a plain aluminum floor. And if we carried ghee, that is that liquid butter that the uh, Indian troops liked, if we carried that and it leaked, you could barely get up to the front of the aircraft because the Dakota has a, quite a slope <laughs> when it's sitting on the ground. Uh, and as for uh, uh, seating, well, we had, we had nothing. If we carried uh, wounded, we simply strapped them down, tied them in with whatever rope we had. And uh, we, uh, mind you, my captain was, he knew every click of the engine, and we flew the same aircraft for uh, about half our tour. And he knew uh, when the engines were running fine, and we never had any problems. With the, the greatest aircraft that I ever flew in. Now, it was, as I say, it was slow, but boy, you got there and got back, and that's the main thing. Then in the middle of 44, 1944. I was orderly corporal, traveling around with the orderly officer one evening, and finally about four o'clock in the morning, we checked in the orderly room, and there was a message there that a lot of people were transferred overseas. And I found my own name on there, a lot of other names, so I went back to the barracks and woke all the guys up and told them, and they didn't believe me, they were ready to throw me in the shower. However, they found out after that it was true and a bit of excitement. And we had some medicals, of course, and then we got into inoculations, and some inoculations are some that actually uh, you have when you go south. We, so we had the rumor going around that we were going to India. Uh, I had a sinus problem at the time, and I was sent across to the south side of Edmonton to see a doctor. and. He examined me and he said, do you want to go overseas or don't you? I said, yes, I do. He said, I don't see a damn thing wrong with you. So I uh, went back and got my inoculations and uh, were shipped overseas, went over in the Aquitania uh, without a convoy, arrived in Greenock, and then from there we were all taken down to Bournemouth and were there for uh, oh, a couple of months and the squadrons were sort of organized, and then we went to the southern part of Wales and we flew to India. We boarded or picked up our own aircraft and uh, traveled with uh, our own air crew and our own ground crew as passengers and all our kit bags and everything as a complete squadron. Uh, we were transported the majority of our additional uh, staff and air crew particularly uh, came out uh, through various other routes. We went, flew over France down to uh, Rabat in Africa, Morocco, and uh, stayed there overnight, laid outside on the ground all night there. I had a chocolate bar in my pocket when in the morning I was just covered with ants. And uh, traveled on to Durbrook, uh, North Africa. Uh, we've seen here in both Sardinia and, and uh, Tobruk the devastation that took place in there. Anyway, from there we went into, uh, next day into Cairo, and uh, we had an opportunity to look at the Sphinx and go through the pyramids. 
and uh, the morning we were supposed to leave, one of the fellows leaned on the elevator and it dropped down. Apparently somebody had sabotaged taking the two nuts off at the bottom part and uh, if we'd taken off we'd have had a problem. So they fixed it up and we took off late that afternoon and uh, flew over to Iran, Iraq and then into, uh, arrived in India. But it was amazing how that happened. As much as the Air Force dollies and dillies around here and there, we were actually within two months or three months of getting my wings, I was on a squadron. Now you can imagine that that was quite a, a, a moment for us when we realized we're going on ops now. And it was just at that time that all of the troop requirements, all the material that were required for the army in Burma was supplied by air because there was no other way. There are no road connections from India into Burma and there are no train connections. The only way, the only dependable way to get anything to them was by air. And then we were flown into Gujarat, which was going to be our training base. And we arrived there in October 1944. This is where we met up with our sister squadron. We were to be formed up now as 435 squadron and 436 squadron. And uh, we had pilots coming in who had never flown Dakotas. They had to be trained. And also we trained, uh, went up to Chaklala training the paratroops who were Gurkhas and they were flying from early morning to go up to Ralpindi and pick up the uh, Gurkha troops and then they would return later in the afternoons and the evenings. The climate was hot during the days up in the 80s and 90s and at nighttime it was fiercely cold and it was quite a contrast. I'd never seen anything like that at the time. And we stayed there until uh, uh, December of 44, and we were moved urgently to a place called Imphal. We were flown with our own aircraft in the same manner that we'd had coming out from England. We'd stopped to refuel on the way over, but we ended up in Imphal about 10 o'clock at night, and we were advised that the aircraft had to be ready for at dawn for takeoff. With loaded with supplies, the British Army were in deep trouble. We were moved into the Infall Valley, 435. It was in Tula Hall, and we were just over the hill from them. Uh, another small base, a temporary base, it was just uh, a dirt strip. We landed onto a, 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 a camp, an encampment, that uh, had bashes that we could sleep in. A basha is a, a bamboo hut with a thatched roof. We, uh, moved into a, an old straw basha that was a mess at 11 o'clock at night. We'd been traveling since 3 o'clock in the morning, and we just laid down on the floor and fell asleep, or more or less. And then in the, the morning we got up, we decided we'd tidy this place up, and they had laid tar paper down as a flooring. So we cleaned that up as best we could, and. Uh, uh, someone decided to look under the tar paper and here we found a, a whole nest of snakes. So out came the machine guns and we cleaned out that place pretty good. Oh, two or three days after we were there, they dumped off a bunch of uh, sacking and bamboo poles in front of every uh, basha. We uh, built our own beds. We took four bamboo poles and hammered them into the ground about that high off the ground. And then we put a little, cut an X, sort of a, a V into them. And uh, then we get two other poles and you get a, a gunny sack bag, cut the four corners off, make it into a stretcher and sit it on there. And then we tie it with, tie it with ropes. And that was what we slept on for, for a couple of months. Uh, we made showers by whatever we could, you know, puncture holes in the bottom of a five gallon tin and uh, put water in it and at least we had a cold water shower. So it was all up to us to do whatever we could. The cooks they simply made whatever they could in the way of a kitchen. They had a few field cookers but basically it was all improvised. But that didn't last too long. Uh, an American, the American squadron that moved out had left a very nice camp up on the other side 
and we moved from the one we were in, which was called Camp Pispur, uh, over to the other camp, which was called Sentinel Hill, and was on a hill, which was important because when the non monsoons came, at least your feet were dry. And the air crews had one advantage over the ground crew that if they completed 700 hours, I believe it was, that was considered a tour. So they were very interested that the aircraft were serviced. We flew every other day. A flight flew one day and then B flight and gave us a day off. And the, the air crew, uh, you know, it didn't seem to matter what the weather was like. It would chug along and get us there and get us back. And that was the main thing. We would get up at, uh, when it was dark at four o'clock in the morning and be down on the strip after breakfast and uh, before it turned light and you were, had your tools ready to service aircraft and you worked your butt off until eight or nine o'clock and by that time the heat was unbearable. And uh, then we would rest for the afternoons that, and then be back at it again at five o'clock and as the aircraft came in at night we did all our inspections and we, they would be pulled off their last trip so that we could do inspections. And uh, as a result, the tonnage that the squadrons had carried and the number of air miles that they'd done and so on and so forth uh, was unequaled by any of the other squadrons in the area. And the troops loved to see us coming because they always had tea ready for us. We landed on uh, strips that were just bulldozed out of a, uh, an area. We would land there, unload our stuff, and they always had a big pot of tea there, big bowl, a great big iron bowl going. And they would reach in with a carnation milk can and give you a real good drink of this stuff. And I'm telling you, boy, it was just like uh, paint remover. I, uh, <laughs> but it's all, they, it, it, no matter whether it was 110 in the shade or whatever, they drank that tea. When we'd go out in the morning, we'd get into the aircraft and start to work immediately. They were already loaded and we had our orders of where to go. And uh, I'd get started up fast and if you could get down to the end of the runway first or second, you might get an extra trip that day. And if we couldn't uh, do a drop, Quite often, we would go into a field that they had ready for us to land on, and we took in uh, reinforcements, brought back wounded, uh, anything that was needed. And our supplies that we took in, there were ammunition, anti-aircraft guns, uh, parts that were needed, uh, medical supplies, food, mail, beer for the troops, liquor for the officers. So that was the, that's where we started as kickers which are now, of course, today loadmasters. We flew without a door in the aircraft, and the, the uh, kickers, what we called kickers, in the back, would pile up what was to be go pushed out as much as they could, fill the doorway, and uh, the pilot would line up over the dropping zone, ring the bell when he thought it was just giving enough lead line time to drop the stuff right onto the dropping zone, and then turn the bell off and the, and the light off when he was over the dropping zone and beyond it. And that was just the window when the kickers had time to push out whatever was to go out. We never bothered wearing straps. We used to stand in the doorway. In fact, I used to just stand in the doorway and hold on the side looking at the jungles were flying over it. Uh, you got so used to doing it, they never thought about it. Sometimes we dropped with parachutes attached. Sometimes it was free dropping. Free dropping was usually rice, for instance. Uh, petrol was dropped in 45-gallon drums with two, air, uh, two parachutes attached to each. And uh, the rice was what we called slack pack double sack. That is, there would be one sack inside, and it was all and another sack outside. So the first one might break, but the second one wouldn't. And it was slack packed. And when they hit, they bounced. And pretty well did not break, so that was a good way. And anyway, everything that was piled out would be shoved out the door, and then the kickers would put another load at the doorway while you flew around and made another circuit. Now it took from eight to 10 circuits to push out your whole load. That was three to three and a half tons of material going out. 
And in those eight and ten or ten circuits, all you did was fly around to get line up and come back over the dropping zone. We had no armament whatsoever. We had no guns. We had no protection. We only had six shooters. <laughs> And so the aircraft were like circling, following each other around doing this, and this officer came in and, and he shot down about four aircraft before he teed off. The first man to see them was the flight commander, Herbie Coons. And he was, he was uh, the OC of B flight when they were caught by the Japanese fighters. And he was the one that took this plane down. That was our only escape get down. If you were in danger, get down. He put his uh, wireless operator in the astrodome so he could watch. And when he reckoned that the fighter was lined up on him and ready to shoot him down, the wag up in the astrodome would give him the signal and he'd make a flat turn one way or the other, very sharp. And the uh, fighter would have to go by and miss him and try and line up again. And he did that three or four times at the same time trying to draw the fighters away from the others. And he ran into a, a, a palm tree with his aircraft and he bent about a three-foot section at the end of the wing up, uh, almost uh, straight up, and he flew it back. It came back that way. And one of his uh, kickers was, was killed and I think two of our planes went down and uh, a couple of other people were wounded in that and uh, well, that was the first time we'd actually realized what we were up against. Then the, we just had the CO decided we were going to fly by night. That was it. Okay, that was all right but trying to find some of those uh, strips in the dark, you know. I remember one was about maybe 150 feet wide, the, the whole clearing in the, in the jungle, and the DAC has a 95-foot wingspan. There wasn't much room on either side. And there were three bonfires lined up down each side to uh, line the strip itself. And we landed in the middle of the jungle in the night by three bonfires on a strip of uh, dirt. At the end, there was a big bonfire that marked the place where you could turn around and uh, take off the opposite way. You landed and took off on the same strip. There was no, no matter of a taxi strip to take you back to a takeoff point. So you landed in one direction and took off in the other direction. And you just had to make sure that it was your turn to take off because the other guy might come, be coming in. The idea was to go in at, say, 5,000 feet, land, get rid of your stuff, then go five minutes north when you took off, and then back that way. Well, of course, it went for about three days that way, and then someone didn't fly far enough north. And I think the CO practice saw the exhaust of some aircraft going the other way, so he decided that was no good either. <laughs> Uh, Mountbatten, when he was made supreme commander, said two things. First off, we won't retreat. If you're surrounded, we'll surround them, and we'll supply you by air, and we'll win. Secondly, we're going to fight right through the monsoons, because at that time, both sides actually had quit during the monsoons. But RCO uh, told Mountbatten, uh, he says, we're not going to worry about the monsoons. We'll fly through the monsoons and we'll do it. You tell us what, what you want and we'll get it there. And he did. Uh, flying in, uh, in Burma was, uh, was fun, but it, there were some, uh, some dicey spots along the way. They told us never fly into a QNIM cloud. Well, if you're going to fly in the, in the monsoons, you're going to fly into a QNIM cloud. There's no way of getting around it. If there was anything that there was the biggest danger to us was f having to fly through the monsoon and thunderstorms, go up over mountains, and, and uh, you'd hit a downdraft that might take you down a thousand feet in five seconds. And then you hit an updraft, but you didn't know when you got a downdraft whether you were behind, right up below the mountain level. So you have to start circling, climbing up and to get to a height above the level. One of these fellows came home and we went down to look 
just as a lesson to the pilots of what could happen. We went down to the strip to look at it. The fairing strips that, that blend the wing root into the fuselage were torn off. One of them anyway was torn off. And the tail plane was at an angle like that to the male pl main plane. In fact, the, the, the fuselage had been twisted. And that's what that monsoon cloud had done. We flew in all kinds of weather every day. We flew in the monsoon. We flew in thunderstorms. And the people who were lost invariably were lost by hitting mountains. They just said, we had, we had no radar. There's no way we could uh, know the mountain was there. We, uh, we uh, they had maps and so on uh, to show where the mountains were and they could certainly give you the courses. But if you got off course or something, you know. Or what we used to call the weather today is 10 tenths cloud with intermingled mountain tops. As a matter of fact, uh, it was so bad that our squadron took one aircraft out of service for flying supplies and sent him up in the morning to, with some oxygen. We had oxygen, but we didn't have any masks on our aircraft. So we normally couldn't, wouldn't fly much above 12,000 feet for very long. Uh, he had to go up to 15 to 18,000. And he was called Watchbird, and he would get a, a stay far enough back that he could pinpoint and give us directions where the main thunderstorms were over the mountains, so that when we were taking off, we'd give him a call and he'd tell us, and so we'd uh, deke around the thunderstorm if he possibly could. And uh, it, w it was a challenge. The, you'd have your, the map reference for a dropping zone way off here somewhere, and especially in the northern part of Burma, it's all jungle and mountains. And mountain means mile after mile of very thickly folded mountains, high ridges and steep gorges and right back up again to another high ridge. And somewhere in there, the army would find a little wee spot where they could make a clearing. And they carved out maybe about 100, uh, 150 feet square and we had to come in over the hills. Crawling around here and there through little valleys and through the tail end of a cloud and flying through cloud and trying to come out again, finding a little weak break that you'd come down and hoped you'd see something that would tell you where you were. Find a dropping zone in the mountains in the monsoon weather, that's a puzzle in itself. I don't know how my navigator ever found those dropping zones, but usually we did. Uh, we only lost one aircraft, I think that's true, to the monsoon, and that was one that it just, no we didn't, others were found and that was okay, but this one, we never found it. We went, I remember my logbook shows, we went searching for him when I went, made on our next sortie, and that aircraft was KN-563, and it was found 50 years afterwards. One of the local Burmese found the aircraft back in, I think it was around 1985, somewhere around there. And he picked up a watch, and he took the watch to a missionary. And the missionary didn't know anything about it, but he somehow got it down to the Tokchan Cemetery at the Rangoon. And even there, they didn't quite know what to make of it. It had an inscription on the back, but that was no help to them. But a visitor said, oh, Jay. That's a, an RCAF number, and that's how that aircraft was discovered, because of the J number on the back of it, the, the J being the prefix for an RCAF officer. The Canadian Army went in and dug up the remains of the aircraft, and uh, we went down, I went down with a group to uh, do the burial. It was quite a moving experience. You can't help your emotions build up. Just Automatic. There's nothing you can do to, to really control it. So. Anyway. And I've often wondered about, you know, it was an intense experience for young people to be there. Everything you were doing was directed toward one thing, fighting this war. And you were all in it together. There was an intensity of, of purpose and uh, dedication in it. And I think that carried out. And that's particularly true in Burma because there was nothing outside of 
of that. There was no life outside the station and no life outside of the people that you were, were all around you. So that there was an intensity to that uh, relationship that you don't find anywhere else. But uh, to me, it's, it's, there were so many other people who did the same thing as I did, so it wasn't unusual. <laughs>